morning guys, hope everyone's doing awesome. I'm just walking back to from the uh, tire place because I found this morning when I'm in my car uh, that I got a super flat uh, white tire which needs to be replaced ASAP, which is like fuck's sake. Um, because all I want to do is just go to the event early because I'm going to have a flat and queue for me how long on a Saturday uh, but it is what it is I guess it needs to be done otherwise I'll be screwed over on the Sunday because I think Sundays are closed and it's not good so yeah uh, my car my tyres seriously need to get uh, repaired because I drove over here over to the uh, tyre place and like a minute drive and you can just hear the tyre just bumping like, over and over because it's so flat I was just going to show you like look how flat that is that is just I, I've had to replace that one and the rear one because uh, both of them were flat and that was the third, third time in three months just insane um, yeah but lucky that I call it now rather than halfway down the motorway so now the tyre is fixed now I can drive which is like yes so, so I'm just walking over to bus stop to then get over to the event Arnold um, hopefully I'm, the queue will be too long but we will see Oh, that is just really annoyed as having today, but it is what it is. Also, the tyre company was really good, it was really quick. I think it took me like, say, 20 minutes to get it all changed, and plus, it was 59 quid, which is like, that's really damn good. Um, but you're in a living crisis, so I'm, I'm really happy about that actually. But 59 quid, didn't want to win today, but it is what it is. Just got off the uh, bus and just realised I've yesterday I basically got off at three stops ago just to walk over say 27 minutes but today I probably did that in three minutes with a bus knowing which stop which stop to get off at and now I'm gonna head over to the NAC what I should have done yesterday but didn't, so we're, le we're learning to get things done more efficiently. Fuck yeah, let's go. <laughs> So I finally got to the NEC, Arnold Place, uh, and just got found out that I don't have to queue up like I did yesterday. Just had to wait around until uh, the gates open for stand uh, standard tickets at 11. So that's really good. Like yes, I've been really happy about that. Special because home crowd, hometown, how does that feel? 
Well, I'm kind of getting used to it now, but it's a little bit crazy to think uh, I started bodybuilding and uh, I did my first competition in 1985. So I'm sure me and the guys at the little gym I was training at Temple Gym, at that point we were never dreaming we'd have a, an expo like this in Birmingham. I mean, like probably had 10 gyms in Birmingham at that time maximum. So. Uh, yeah, it's amazing to be here in, uh, in the hometown where it all started for me. And let's talk a bit about your training. So back in the day, back in your heyday, not only were you admired, obviously, because of your physique, but you weren't afraid to try something different. The, the way in which you trained was unmatched at that time, and it was something slightly different to what everybody else was doing. Could you talk us through that? Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> fortunately, I have an inbred ability to... Um, take information from various sources and then decide what's going to work for me. So um, a kind of an independent thinker. And even before I started bodybuilding, I was reading about training, I was reading about nutrition, getting as much information as I could, which wasn't so easy then because now you can click a button on the internet and you can find pretty much anything you want. Uh, then we had to wait for the magazines or buy books or I went to the library to get books on nutrition to see how much protein and carbs and fats are in these foods and do my own calculations and all this stuff uh, so there's a bit more effort required then um, but yeah I was I would try this uh, training the high intensity training that I was reading about and I would keep notes and then I would train more frequently and I would keep notes or I would train less. And so by doing this, by analyzing everything, I could actually see what was working, what wasn't working and uh, go with that feedback rather than what I read in the magazine or a guy in the gym that was older and more experienced and bigger than me. Listening to him just because he was bigger, I was able to make my own mind up. So uh, I was using high intensity training, which was really first pioneered by a guy called Arthur Jones that built the Nautilus machines and he's really the first guy to say hey what is it what is it that triggers muscle growth and it's the intensity of exercise not the duration of the frequency but the intensity and then this needs to be combined with that stress of intensity recovering which obviously is time and nutrition and, and rest and everything like that and uh, I'm still very convinced it's the most efficient way to train and fortunately now there's multiple scientific studies that are saying exactly the same thing. Uh, there was a meta study so you know a lot of studies together. What's the minimum amount of effective exercise to trigger muscle growth and the conclusion was one set of an exercise once a week to failure. I'm like, I'm glad the scientists caught up with me because I've been saying it for 40 years, yeah? I was going to say that, that's quite a good moment for you, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> and, and this extends, and I was saying this, if you only want to see the Joe Rogan podcast I did several years ago, I said it to Joe Rogan, <clears throat> I said, to get cardiovascular fitness, you can do that in five or six minutes twice a week. And he was like, what? Well, how can you do that? I said, because you do sprints. And... Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of scientific studies now. Actually, there's a book out called The One Minute Workout, which is a little bit misleading because it's not one minute. You do 20 seconds all out burst and then a minute easy, and you do this three times. So it's one minute of intense exercise and three minutes of moderate exercise. So four minutes <clears throat> and uh, scientific studies testing VO2 max and all these different parameters found out that. Yes, you can get great cardio fitness from that amount of exercise because it's the trigger. The trigger is the intensity and basically that's what I've been saying for many years. So, guys, two mistakes in the gym. First of all, you are not training hard enough. Number two, you're training too often and too long. That's it. Thanks. I see that all the time. That's it, you can leave now. That's yeah. <laughs> you've got those golden words. Let's say a competition, maybe you're going to do it once a year. Maybe twice, but that's probably going to be it. Uh, so that's two days a year you're going to stand on stage and, and show your uh, what you've done, basically. 
So I enjoyed the process of uh, the mental process of discovering the best way, the best nutrition, the best training, everything like that. I had to find that out myself and there was no internet. So that was a challenge that I enjoyed. And I enjoyed the challenge in the gym of pushing myself and seeing how hard I could push myself and basically overcoming uh, myself. You know, nobody wants to feel really uncomfortable and uh, in pain and so on. So it was a challenge uh, basically to kind of have mastery over myself and my own mind and my own thoughts. And that's an ongoing process always, you know. I was going to say, that's a task which I think everyone would love to have the secret. You know, how do you do that? So. How did you begin to tackle that, especially if you were doing this on your own? Some people have a huge team behind them to deal yeah. with mental strength and sports psychology. Well, the thing that appealed to bodybuilding, one of the things that appealed to me about bodybuilding is that it was an individual effort at that point. Now, uh, yeah, now it is becoming more of a team because you have a coach and a nutritionist and so on sometimes. Yeah? So, but that didn't really exist in my day. And if it did, I wouldn't be, I don't think I'm a coachable person because if a coach would tell me what to do, I would be like, but why? But, and I need to undo all the pieces and find out why I'm doing this, otherwise I can't do it. So, not really that coachable. I'm not saying I didn't ever listen to anybody. I would take information from here, from there, from there, and then I would find out if it worked for me and decide whether you know it's useful or not. Um, but to have mastery over your own mind, that's an ongoing process, and I think I'm still, working on that and I'm still getting better at it. It's, it's, it's always a process. But oh, because I didn't want people looking at me and I didn't want people telling me how great I looked. Because then maybe, oh, I look great, I can relax now. So I was covered up all the time and I said, I'm just gonna show this when I've got the product that's finished in front of my peers, in front of the judges that I assume they know what they're looking at rather than anybody else that, you know, I, I didn't need the attention. So. Um, probably different from most people that get into bodybuilding because they get into it because they want the attention, they want people to look at them and I, I didn't want that, I didn't feel comfortable with that. So just once a year I was going on the stage, basically I saw my body as a, like a project or an artwork or something, like I'm working on it and I'll show you it when I'm finished at the end of the year what I've done, like unveiling a piece of art or a painting or something, I didn't want people to look at it while it was not quite finished, so I think that was my approach. And where did the nickname The Shadow come from? Uh, the, but work in progress, always. Yeah. Always trying to learn more. And do you think that also gave you an edge? As we've said, you know, sixth time Mr. Olympia consecutively. Was that something that you were doing that maybe set you apart from everybody else besides your peers? I think, well, for, I had a different training approach, obviously, which I think was more effective. Um, and I had a different mental approach, which was, I don't want to sound arrogant, but I felt like I was unbeatable because I knew there was nobody out there that was 24 hours a day, even when you're asleep and you're dreaming, is dreaming about training, is dreaming about this goal. It's, it's literally all I thought about. So if you got that amount of uh, attention on something, you're giving it energy, you're giving it power. And I knew, that none of my other competitors were doing that to that degree. They may have had, arguably, you know, it's a debate, right? They could arguably could have had better physical potential, but they didn't put the other aspects together so well. So that's kind of what made me feel unbeatable. I thought I'm doing this to the extent that nobody else is doing it, so therefore they won't be able to beat me. And that's just an attitude that I carried with myself being almost, would you say obsessed almost? Is that is that the right word to use or not? You know, being in the gym constantly? Yeah, I, I was obsessed, which is not healthy, but uh, it's not normal to want to be the best in the world at something. So it's great. It's a tool that you can use, but you've got to be able to turn it on and off and you've got to be able to decide whether that level of commitment, that level of focus and single-mindedness on one subject is actually beneficial to you. Because I've seen people try to do it and sacrifice everything else in their life and never achieve that goal. So you have to mix some realism in with it. Um, I had a checkpoint actually when I turned pro. I said if I don't get in the top five at this first pro show, then I don't have what it takes. 
simple as that. And I won't, won't continue on this path. I will continue to, yeah, I love it, train, bodybuild. I had a gym, maybe I'll open more gyms. Because realistically, if I don't get in the top five and the top one, I'm not gonna be Mr. Olympia. I'm not gonna be the best guy, and that's what I'm here for. So, kind of put myself under a lot of pressure for my first pro show, and uh, you know, unfortunately, I got quite a close second in my first pro show, and I got flown out to Los Angeles to do shoots with Joe Weider's magazines, which was every bodybuilder's dream at that point. If you wanted to make it in bodybuilding, you had to get in Joe Weider's magazine. So uh, that was a turning point for me. If, if I didn't get in the top five, I would have not continued with competitive bodybuilding. Wow. And at that time when you were winning time and time again, Mr. Olympia, did you do anything differently in that time? Or was it a case of if it's not broke, don't fix it? I, I pretty much, uh, because I'm analytical, because I, I, I literally wrote down every single workout that I ever did in 12 years. I wrote down any diets, uh, supplements, steroids, yes, whatever. It's all listed there and this works, keep it. This doesn't work, move it out. So eventually you get a game plan together that uh, works pretty well, but then you have to realize that your body doesn't always respond exactly the same way and so on. So you have to have a little flexibility in there, but basically, yes, I had a game plan and it didn't change very much. And at what point did you decide to leave that career behind? What was the catalyst? Uh, really, um, I had no choice in the matter. I had an injury in 97, which is a torn tricep tendon, which required surgery. And I knew after that, that I wouldn't be able to train the way I wanted to. Um, it's affecting me aesthetically now because I already had one injury. Now I've got another one. And if I continue, somebody's going to beat me just because I can't actually train the way I want to train. So better to stop now. Uh, while I'm at the top before that happens and um, yeah, huge uh, change in my life because of this was not planned. Dorian likes to plan everything and try to control it or oh, this was out of my control. It was an injury and hey, your career is now ended. So it was um, pretty traumatic that I didn't prepare myself for that. So uh, that was tough, but that's the way it ended. and. Uh, it was tough at the time, but now I look back and say, hey, that was probably a blessing in disguise. It was time for you to, to change and time for you to shift gears for, for many reasons. And so who is Dorian Yates now? What are you working towards now and where's your passion and your focus? Looking to learn more and develop more and continually uh, being on that path. And I'm traveling around the world with my business and so on and meeting people and uh, helping people. I've been training people online and I've been using this high intensity methods with people online and in person that are in no way actually bodybuilders. They're more like average people and I'm seeing amazing uh, health results. I had a guy that um, really changed people's health rather than, hey, uh, you know, can I help the next guy be the most muscular man in the world and Mr. Olympia. It's where I used to be, it's where my interest used to lie, but to be honest, my interest lies now more in how can we use this to uh, make the general population more healthy, and it's, it's quite easy. You know, if you, I tell everybody, if you have 30 minutes twice a week, you do the correct training and you follow a good diet, it'll literally change your life. It is, you don't need to be going to the gym five or six days a week, it's a huge myth and it's a waste of time and a waste of energy. And normally that's what people say. Well, I'd like to get in shape, but I don't have time. So let's get rid of that myth. Yeah? You put data in a computer, you put information in a computer, and your brain is a computer, and you have information in there. Where does it come from? Your own experiences in life? The people around you, your family, your friends, etc. Uh, the government, the media, movies, the music, every piece of information that goes in is data in your computer and you view life through the lens of that information of what you believe is true and not true and good and bad and so on. And uh, I think doing psychedelics kind of 
blows that apart a little bit and it allows your box that you've been put in to have the walls broken and for you to be able to see things and think things in a different way. To sum it up as briefly as I can, I think that that would be it. So then you're looking at life from a different way with a different um, perspective and an ability to be open to more and new information. Whereas before, if it contradicted the picture you've got, you'll be very resistant to it. It's hard to change somebody's mind. If they, be, if they have a belief which they believed all their life, it may very well be wrong, but it's traumatic for people to try to change that. It's interesting because that sounds quite different to the Dorian we spoke about, you know, the methodical planning and, and now you're talking about open minds. You know what, I think now is a good time to throw it open um, for today. Absolutely fascinating. Um, you, you really clearly come across like somebody who was before your time in terms of mind strength and not just body strength. Yet your focus today is on helping people be healthy in their body. How could you use your experience in your, your natural strengths internally to help people today from a mindset perspective? Um, <clears throat> well, just that, I think that uh, I can give you, you know, I can give you a physical routine to do at the gym. I can give you a diet and everything, but uh, whatever you're doing, the mind is always the glue that's gonna hold it together. Um, so it's important that you know why you're doing it what you're doing, um, why you're going to the gym, why you're putting this effort in. Um, if you don't know, then you're not really gonna push yourself to the zone that, because it's uncomfortable. But I'm going there for a short period of time, it's gonna be over in half an hour, I'm gonna push there, I'm gonna push, because that's gonna give me the results that I want. So it's just having the right frame of mind and the, the right approach. And I think when people come to train with me, yeah, they learn about training, but if I have an hour together with somebody in the gym or 45 minutes or whatever it is, I show them what they can do. Everybody that comes to train with me thinks they're finished when they've done eight or nine reps. I'm like, no, you haven't. Do another one, do another one. And they always get a bit more. And then I say to them, you did that. You lifted that way, I'm Dorian Yates, I'm a picture in your mind, I'm whoever you think I am. Just because I'm shouting at you, that helped you to lift that way. But I didn't do it for you, you did it, I just triggered something in your mind that made you do that. So now you know that you can do it, you know that next time. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much the approach. Thanks for the question. Let's take a walk with my agent on it. Um, with regards, well, I know you said on your podcast with Joe Rogan that you'd have a glass of wine or two, even in your training days on the weekend. Yeah. Uh, so what would your advice be to the general population, you know, men and women that want to put on a bit of muscle mass, with regards to alcohol and its detriments? Okay, so alcohol is a, is a funny thing because it's a poison and it's very destructive in excess amounts, but Actually, people that drink one or two alcoholic drinks a day, they have a better health outcome and better longevity than somebody that drink, doesn't drink anything at all. So I don't see anything wrong in having a, a one beer or a glass of wine, something like that. If you have a lot and you're gonna get drunk, then you're putting a ton of stress on your body. Uh, your liver's gotta process the toxins. You're not gonna be performing the next day at your peak, which is, you know, if you're going to the gym, you need to be. So, one drink is fine uh, a few times a week. I wouldn't worry about it, but excess alcohol is going to have damaging effects on your recovery, uh, not to mention the excess calories and so on. So, in moderation, I think it's fine. If I was getting ready for a competition, I might have one glass of wine a week still, you know. It's, uh, whatever, 150 calories or something, so I just totally my calories. So my alcohol in moderation, I don't see a, a problem with it, it's an individual choice. That it's, answer has made my day, I have to say. <laughs> that's the full go I ahead, to have a couple of drinks in the evening. Thanks for that, Dorian. Let's uh, turn it all down. Yeah, question I get asked a lot. So if Dorian Yates started bodybuilding now, 
could, could he be the shadow? Could you? It, it's difficult because that's the way that you get your, yourself out there, right? Your message is in the, the social media, where in my day it was simply the magazines. So what I would do after winning a contest, I would do a lot of photo shoots. I'd do a week full of photo shoots, which means then there's a lot of footage of me training, whatever, while I'm in shape at the contest, and that footage would be used for the whole year. So then I could disappear back into my dungeon and, and concentrate on my training again. But yes, I believe that would be uh, difficult to do today because people make money online from YouTube, from social media and so on. Um, so it would probably be difficult for me to be the shadow, but maybe I could have got my uh, message across about the training, the training methods more, if I'd have been in control of how that was uh, going out there. So, you know, I, I don't see anything really in life as being good or bad. It's whatever you want to, it's whatever you do with it, you know. So the internet is a source of information and it's a platform and it's what you want to do with it. So, yeah, it would be difficult to have exactly the same approach uh, as I did back in the 80s and 90s now. Are there now, who is just at the beginning of their bodybuilding career, what would you say? Um, try not to waste time, you know, because it's really hard work anyway. So try to make it efficient and one of the keys I would advise, and now you've got technology, yeah? So I just had exercise books from WH Smith and a pen, and I got a stack of them there with all my workouts in, all my nutrition, everything. I would strongly advise you to keep a track of what you're doing, whether it's a notebook or it's on your phone or whatever, keep a track of what you're doing. If you make changes to your diet or your supplements or your training, make one change at a time. And then you analyze what, it's like a science experiment, yeah? You gotta do one change at a time, see what happens, positive, negative, keep it, throw it out. You wanna change something else later on, do that one thing at a time, and keep records and see how you're going. And if you didn't make any progress in the last two months, something needs to change, because the next two months will be exactly the same golden advice. Thank you so much for that, Dorian. Look, I mean, I could chat to you all day, but I know that there's a lot of people that want to meet you and get up close and personal. So I'll let